Welcome to Black Nouveau. This is our edition for April 6th, 2016. I'm Joanne Williams. It's hard to think about child care in Milwaukee without thinking of Gray's Child Development Center. Liddy Collins profiles the woman behind the service. We'll take a tour of the Haitian art exhibit at the Milwaukee Art Museum, and we'll meet the music director and one of the stars of Sirens of Song, currently on stage at the Milwaukee Rep's Stackner Cabaret. It's baseball season, and the boys of summer are in full swing. Next Monday, PBS premieres Ken Burns' new documentary on number 42, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson knew once he got in the door, you could knock down all of these conventions. First, you get out there and you prove you can play. Then you can start talking back to umps. Then you start dealing with writers on your terms instead of their terms. A lot of us talk a good talk. He actually walked the walk. He got up every day and tried to make things better. He said that we're only measured by the differences we make in the lives of other people. Jack, I never called him Jackie, meant everything to me. We were deeply in love and we were a real partnership. I think it's difficult for the general public to know much about his private life and the family life was very important to Jack. He was a very committed person. I think the thing that I enjoyed about him early on was the sense of commitment he had to other people. Claiborne Benson III is the executive director of the Wisconsin Black Historical Society and Museum, and he knows a thing about Jackie Robinson. Welcome. Thank you very much. You know, in his latter years, we're talking Jackie Robinson. Yes. He came to the Milwaukee Boys and Girls Club uh, and was guest speaker, and there was a big effort on the part to bring him here. Uh, he worked with young people, was very well received in Milwaukee. Um, the school is named after him here. Uh, of course, it's not used anymore, but his daughter came after the book. His wife came at the groundbreak uh, when they changed the name of the school. Um, they liked Milwaukee. Yeah. And, and Jackie Robinson, as we know, broke into baseball in 1947. Yes. Why do you think he was the first one chosen to break the color barrier? Why him? Determination to uh, fight against uh, discrimination uh, on the part of teammates and other ball players. He he rose above that. He saw baseball as being very important, and African Americans should be engaged and involved in it. So he uh, he worked very hard. That was a big responsibility for him to take on, not just playing baseball, but taking on the slings and arrows that he was going to have to yes. absorb. Especially the base stealing, uh, and they punished him severely every time he stole a base. They would spike him. That uh, Yes, little things and personal kinds of things where he, they called him all kinds of names where he f felt that he wanted to fight back, but he didn't. Um, Jackie Robinson was very important for baseball, and especially for African Americans. Too few African Americans are engaged in baseball today. But uh, when Jackie Robinson came in, more and more African Americans wanted to play baseball. A little bit about him, too. Uh, baseball wasn't his only sport, right? Football. Played it in college. I wanted to choose between the two. But baseball, uh, the Negro League first uh, in involvement in that, uh, he then went into major leagues. Now, he got involved in, in speaking out about civil rights more after his playing days, but he did something that I understand Rosa Parks did, but he did it before she did. He did it when he was in the Army in 1945. He was a lieutenant, and he was asked to sit in the back of the bus. That's when it was segregated Army. Uh, and he refused to sit in the back of the bus. Uh, he was even court-martialed uh, for that, and uh, he stood up for it again. That was the early signs of a Jackie Robinson who believed in standing up for his rights. He could have exhibited that same kind of behavior while playing baseball, but he didn't. He wanted to uh, make baseball real for African Americans. He's one of the giants of our history, but there are other giants of our history that are on the wall on the outside of your museum. However, the wall needs some work, right? Well, the wall is not a wall designed to be faced to the general public. It is a wall. Uh, it's supposed to be squeezed between two buildings, and so thus uh, 
this wall and this wall needs to be repaired. Bricks are falling out, um, chippings of the, the, the tile is coming down or wall. Um, so we're going to repair the wall and then put the mural back up there. And as you can see, the wall starts at the beginning of Egypt and the great civilization of uh, Egyptian people and ends up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A people on a journey, and it looks at the struggle of African Americans as we make our way through various journeys, migration, civil war, um, civil rights activities, um, um, military activities, all, all African Americans participated in it and experienced it. Now, Exactly where is the wall? I'm sure people have seen it, but they don't realize what they're looking at. Where, where do we see it? I'm told that some people see it as just as some drawings on the wall as they pass by. It's on 27th and Center. It's a mural that uh, faces to the west of, um, of the building. So, yes, it's an it's important mural for us, and we wanna, we've been wanting to do it for some time, and thus we're embarking on it now. It's not a, a small undertaking to uh, refurbish that mirror. How it's much lot, is it going to cost? It's, it's going to cost as much as $30,000 because the wall, mo mostly because the wall needs treatment and work. Uh, it needs uh, tuck pointing uh, bad. It needs uh, sandblasting. It needs um, a primer uh, and treat the brick. Uh, all long before the artist starts working. And we plan to start working on it fairly soon. And, and who's the artist? Amar. Amar. Okay. Uh, Amar is a nationally known artist, and he has uh, been around quite a bit. He's going to be doing... If people want to know more about the wall? Uh, call 372-7677. Uh, and there's a... Uh, on our website or uh, Facebook uh, website, there is an uh, article about it. The Journal Sentinel did an article uh, last Sunday. Uh, there's an interview on there and a story, written story, about that. That's so it. We'll, we'll see how it comes out. I hope Terrific. it's bright and beautiful by summertime. Thank very you very much, much, Claiborne, for being with us. Thank you. The most important Haitian artists are included in this collection and really outstanding examples of all of their works. And unfortunately, with the earthquakes in Haiti, a lot of the original works of art were damaged. And so because this collection is here, we have first-rate examples of these artists' work. We are in the Coles Art Generation Lab that is home to the Richard and Erna Flagg collection of Haitian art here at the Milwaukee Art Museum. It's about 45 works of art, which basically runs from about the 1940s, the late 1940s, into the 1980s. There was a Milwaukee businessman, Richard Flagg, who um, owned the Flagg Tanning Company, and he and his wife, Erna, were art collectors. And they got interested in Haitian art, and they, they built their collection, and then in 1991, they gave it to the Milwaukee Art Museum. I think this is the first time that it's been presented in a gallery that really allows you to kind of consider the work in and of itself, but then also combined with these educational elements really helps you understand what these Haitian artists were thinking, how they were making their art in context of, of the, the country, the Haitian culture that they were living in at the time. This is the first time that the gallery is, is organized into three kind of schools of Haitian art. Um, and it has to do with where the artists were located. There's the Port-au-Prince School, which is where the Centre d'Art, the first major school of art that was a, a central place for Haitian artists to come and either learn how to make art or share their ideas about art, or it, it functioned as a commercial gallery. It opened in 1944 in Port-au-Prince. Hector Hippolyte is one of the artists that they collected in depth, and we have a lovely wall of Hippolyte's work. He is probably considered the most important Haitian artist to come out of the Centre d'Art. A lot of the subject matter has to do with religion, and so that's in one part of the gallery. Another part of the gallery is the Cap Haitian School, which is another a northern city in Haiti. Stylistically, that art is a little bit flatter, 
and the subject matter often is either secular subject matter or a lot of historic moments, so capturing some of the important dates or events in Haitian history. There are education components that are integrated throughout the space to help contextualize the collection. For instance, there's a station that addresses the steel drum sculptures. We have nine steel drum sculptures hanging on a wall, a couple more freestanding ones in the galleries, and um, this station kind of takes you through the process of how those are made. They're made in a suburb north of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, called Croix de Bouquet. And this town has become famous for making these sculptures. So these sculptures start out as oil drums, and they are repurposed into these sculptures, and these artists have to flatten the drums out, and then they carve them, and then they have to, you know, file them down. And so this station lets you see that process in all of its stages. The sculptures are beautiful, and so when you're looking at them on the wall, you can, you know, sit there and say, oh, that's a metal sculpture, but then when you think about the fact that they were actually a cylinder. The shape of the material was actually the cylinder. Um, at one point, I think that helps you understand the creative process behind the works. I think people are really gonna be surprised to see how many examples um, of those sculptures we have, and, and, and they're displayed in a really innovative way. A lot of the artists in this collection were self-taught and we have a, a long-standing commitment to the work of self-taught artists. I'm really proud of how we um, use the architecture of the mezzanine level, which is where this gallery is located, um, and kind of went out of bounds um, and went beyond the gallery in some cases. Um, how we kept it open, it's a very open feeling to it, but we are still showing a lot of art Really, we're hoping with this new gallery, with this kind of integrated curatorial and education components to really kind of round out people's understanding of Haitian culture. And an understanding that they're seeing in this gallery some of the world's greatest paintings by Haitian artists right here in Milwaukee. Children are not different then the environment is different. Our children need so much more than what they're getting. Meet Betsy Gray, a woman whose name is synonymous with daycare. In 1973, she started Gray's Child Care Development Center in her Milwaukee home on North 3rd Street, now MLK Drive. At one time, there were 14 centers, a few located in Catholic schools, St. Boniface, Holy Redeemer on Hampton. We were on the north side, we were on the west side, we were on the south side. We were at the MATC campuses. I uh, connected with the uh, dean of, of MATC and I said, you have people that's going to classes at night, you know, what they do for childcare. So I convinced them that if they had a, a class of childcare at night, that people would use it. And they did, so we were at downtown, West Dallas, Oak Creek, Mequon. The centers were consolidated with the purchase of a convent in 1991 and operated at this location for 21 years. The one thing about that, um, when we took over that building, that convent on Titonia, I, you know, I could see all the beauty, but I didn't see all the expense involved. I mean, it was, it was, I can't, I can't even, when I tell people we had a $35,000 a month utility bill. I can believe it, that building is huge. I mean a month, 35,000. And um, I just said, this is, is just got to be too much. Grace said her difficulties were not having enough business background. I love children and I thought I can help them and I can do so much, but I didn't know that I had to have stainless steel steel pots, you know, when the city came in. And uh, they said, you know, and I had my pots, it was in my home, we lived there. And they said, well, you, you gotta have stainless steel. And I'm thinking, what am I gonna do with my pots? You know, they work fine for me. And of course, that was the rule, we had to have stainless steel pots. And then the lights, 
fluorescent lights, you got to change the lights. So I had to do it, make a lot of changes in my home because of the child care. So there were rules that I, I was not familiar with. So I learned, you know, along, along the way. Learning was why Betsy Gray came from Pine Bluff, Arkansas to Milwaukee. She came to go to Marquette University's nursing school. Her daughter, Wanda Montgomery, who worked with her, said marriage and a family deferred her educational dream. So she wanted to get her degree, and she did. She went to UWM part-time for 10 years until she got her bachelor's. And then, a few years later, my mother and I both went to Marquette together for our master's, and we graduated the same day with our master's. And to say, what are you getting it for? I say, I just, I want to have it. You know, I'm not getting it to keep my job. I own the business, but I just wanted to have that. The rules and regulations in the child care industry have changed. It's changed in that people consider it now as a business, whereas before, a lot of people looked at child care as a uh, babysitting service. And it was really insulting to me many times when uh, I'd hear that, you know, uh, we're going to bring our kids to, we need a babysitter. And I'm saying, you know, well, we don't babysit. You know, we're professionals. We don't babysit. But people really had that idea. The positive is that they're requiring uh, more training. I, I think, you know, I think before people felt that um, if they took uh, one or two classes, they were all set. Well, now with this, um, with this uh, rate star rating, it's like people have to have, if they're going to direct a program, they got to have some college training. They can't just get one or two classes, and I think that's good. And then another the thing that happened, they, um, there's a national accreditation that was not in place when I started back in 73. And so uh, we were the first African-American center in Wisconsin to get that accreditation. Bessie Gray's advice for those wanting to go into the child care business, make sure you have all the basics. Why do you want to start a program? What's your goal? It's got to be more than 11 children. You know, that, that's a key component, but it's got to be much more than that. Take some business courses. Which, you know, I, I took business courses after I got started. <laughs> It, I mean, I learned real quick I got to get an accountant. You know, I was doing the checks. I was, I was trying to do the whole thing, even when we had two or three programs. And I said, um, I got to have someone to do this. It's too much. I can't do it. So I would, I would advise anybody that this is going to start a business. And I tell people now, before you eat, pay your taxes. I just try to make it real plain. <laughs> pay taxes first. <laughs> When I look at what my mother provided, it went beyond that. And when you were really um, concerned about not only the children, but their families, um, that goes beyond the business because you can't pay for the type of care that my mother was able to provide. in the street to You'll Never Walk Alone. Sirens of Song looks at women in America through a 20th century catalog of music. We're joined by cast member Maisha McQueen and the show's musical director, Abdul Hamid Royal. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks. Now, first I have to start with a Milwaukeean. You're from Milwaukee. Born and raised. And you started playing the piano when? When I was four years old. Why? <laughs> well, <laughs> I was playing the piano around the house, and my parents decided that if I was going to play, maybe I should uh, take some lessons. And so I went to the conservatory. 
Oh boy. Yeah. And and you learned well, I would guess. Not so bad. Yeah. Not so bad. It's been a good ride. Now, what's your history with music? Did you start at four? Uh, not as young as four. I started singing a little later in life. I started uh, as a visual artist, and then I got into singing around middle school, and I went to a performing arts high school for singing and acting, and then I ended up going to NYU for musical theater. Well, but how'd you know you were going to be a singer? Did somebody just say, hey, you sound good, or did you... I actually uh, was singing to my family members on the phone, and my aunt told my mother that I could sing, and my mother was in denial about it, until finally she heard me sing at a, a graduation in middle school and was like, all right, well, I guess I got to support her in her endeavor, so... So she did. She did. And we all benefit from that. Tell me about Sirens of Song. Tell me about, is it an, uh, an anthology, or is, or is there a plot to this, and there's music wrapped around it? Mm -hmm. How does it work? There is a plot. Uh, it is about 80% music, um, and the music is mostly popular music from throughout the 20th century. Uh, there is a plot. Uh, we are sirens. We're sort of um, these sort of, I don't want to say extraterrestrial, but demi- God type of beings who sort of are on our way to uh, a battlefield, not to tell too much about the plot, but then we get caught in between somewhere and we're, we are stuck in this uh, display window with female mannequins. And through uh, exploring this space, we begin to explore the journey of women throughout the 20th century through popular music. So, uh, we talked about some of the popular music, Dancing in the Street, which was out when I was, long before I was born. Sure. How <laughs> did you choose the music to put in this production? Interestingly enough, the music was chosen by the co-creators, uh, Pearl Ramsey and Kevin Ramsey, who also directed the piece. Uh, they chose about 40 songs that they thought would um, move the story forward and uh, sort of take the audience on this journey from the early 20th century right straight through Phenomenal Woman. Mm-hmm. What, what role do you play? Are you a Phenomenal Woman? I think we all are. Uh, there's three of us. We all play sirens. Um, in Greek mythology, the sirens were uh, women who, there are different ways that they are told about, but they kind of communicate through music. And so all three of us uh, are sirens. I'm siren number three doesn't really have much significance, um, uh, but we all tell our individual story, have our own arc, so to speak, throughout the, the journey of the music. Who are the other performers? Amelia Cormack. Um, she's originally from Australia, beautiful talent. Um, she's done a work on the West End in London, and then uh, a woman by the name of Bertilla Baker, who has an extraordinary um, uh, resume in, in the performing arts, and they're both recording artists, such as myself, and um, it's been wonderful sharing the stage with the two of them. They're wonderful women. So it's a three-person cast? Three persons. No men? Uh, I'm there. I oh, consider me. him to be a cast member as well, and I, I mean, really, you know, he is a musical director. He has done an amazing job of helping us to explore this music that everybody knows uh, through a theatrical lens. Um, but he also, to me, is our fourth cast member. So what songs am I going to hear, and am I going to be tempted to sing along? Of course, that's the whole idea. <laughs> um, the sirens bring uh, the, experience, the historic experiences of women, and uh, if we're successful, and we are, I think most of the time, you hear the voices of women uh, in the audience, uh, everything from We Shall Overcome, I'm Every Woman, um, there's a medley of uh, My Boyfriend's Back, uh, through I Didn't Raise My, my Son to Be a Soldier. Um, there are all kinds of music, and I think it's a wide enough appeal that there's something for everybody in Sirens. Do you mind if the audience hums along? Absolutely not. That's what they're there for. <laughs> Have a good time. It's, it is a good time, right? It's not, it's not a sad production. Oh, absolutely not. I, I think uh, it's thoughtful. Um, there are definitely moments where um, uh, the audience is asked to to think through uh, their experience with this music and with the with the, the narrative that's being told. But I mean, it's 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 certainly an uplifting moment. Uh, there are moments uh, where the audience is clapping along. Uh, audiences uh, moments where the audience is singing along and. Uh, and there's really something for everybody in Sirens. So for folks who don't often go to the theater, this is a place to start, right? I would say so. I think if you are a music lover, then you're going to love 
the show. Um, and as he stated, I do think we do kind of take you on an emotional journey, which is what all theater should do. Uh, um, I don't, I don't tend to categorize theater as sad or happy. I think we, you know, women have not always had it easy. And so we have to kind of examine that before we celebrate how far we've come. Well, we've come, we've come a long way. And we I, have. We'll have to stop there because we have to go and see the show to find <laughs> out more. Right. Please Thank do. Thank you both for coming. Thank, Thank you. Talking you. about Sirens of Song. Thank you. Thank for you so us. much. Sirens of Song runs through May 29th at the Milwaukee Reps Stackner Cabaret. Would you like to see it? We have four pairs of tickets to give to four viewers who can answer our quiz question. Here are the rules. We need your name your address, your phone number, and the correct answer to the question. Without all four, you can't win the tickets. Now here's the question. What group had the original hit recording of Dancing in the Street? Call us at 414-297-7556 or email us at tvviewer at mptv.org. The contest closes at 6 p.m. on April 10th, 2016. If you've won one of the contests within the last six months, you're not eligible for this one. And that's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching. Three.